Welcome back. In this video, we'll look at more details about functions and how to use the stack. Last time we looked at a simple leaf function. Today we'll look at non-leaf functions. These are functions that call another function or call themselves recursively. The problem with a non-leaf function is that the RA return address will get overwritten. And so the solution to that is to save the return address on the stack. The stack is a contiguous section of memory consisting of stacks of words. The stack pointer points to the top of the stack, and the stack grows upwards as items are placed on the stack, which means that their addresses will become smaller. A push operation copies a register onto the top of the stack. A pop operation copies a value from the stack into a register. Many instruction set architectures have dedicated push and pop instructions, but MIPS uses load word and store word. Before storing a word on the stack, we need to adjust the stack pointer by negative four. Four because each stack location is a word, which is four bytes, and negative because we're growing upper towards lower addresses. And then we can copy the register, in this case S3, out to the stack. This is how we achieve a push in MIPS. A pop is the opposite of a push. First we copy the word at the top of the stack into the register of our choice, in this case S3, and then we adjust the stack pointer by positive 4. So now the stack pointer is pointing below where that data was. Notice that it's still out there now in the unused portion of the stack in an area considered garbage. Many leaf functions won't need to use the stack, but this function overwrote the S0 register, and so the convention dictates that it must push S0 at the top of the function and pop it back into S0 at the end of the function. Of course, this function could have been written without using S0, but this is just for illustration purposes. I put that function in a program, and I put a value into S0 so that I could watch and make sure that S0 got preserved across the function call. And I also put a couple of values in T0 and T1 to show that those values are not preserved across the function call. So let's hit assemble, and I want to jump down to where my function actually starts, which I can see is right here after my exit. I can see my push right here. So let me hit a breakpoint and start there. And before we actually execute the code in the function, let's just check over here in our register file and see that S0 has negative 1, and T0 and T1 have 9. So let's single step through pushing on the stack. First we adjust our stack pointer by 4, and then we store the data out there. So notice that when I did that, I moved from being in the data segment to being in the stack segment. All right, I'm going to skip through these statements here. Here's where I'm overriding S0. S0 is now 10. And so after popping that off the stack, S0 has been restored to negative 1, and we can jump back to the calling code. So now we're back in the calling code, and we see that S0 still has negative 1. T0 and T1 have been overwritten, and that's just fine according to our conventions. These conventions that say the values of the S registers must be preserved across the function call, they're just conventions. They're not enforced by the assembler. They're just agreed upon by MIPS programmers to make the code easier to read and debug. And in that way, you don't have unexpected side effects in your functions. Next, we look at processing data a character or byte at a time. The load byte or load byte unsigned can grab data a byte at a time. Load byte unsigned is usually used for characters since we don't want any sign extension. And then store byte can store a byte at a time. Let's look at the C code on the left. What the C code does is copy a character at a time from Y to X until the null terminator has been copied. 
The equivalent code in MIPS is on the right. Again, we're overwriting S0, so we're saving that onto the stack. And then we're letting T1 be the address of Y, T3 be the address of X, and T2 holds the character that we're copying and writing. We'll stay in this loop until the value that was copied and written is the null terminator 0, at which time we're ready to leave the function. Before we leave it, we have to restore S0. What if you need to store more than one word on the stack? You could do an add i, store word, add i, store word, add i, store word, etc. Or you could just adjust the stack pointer by the number of words times 4 and then use the number in front of the stack pointer address as an offset. We see that here, three words are pushed onto the stack at the top of the stack and then those three words are popped off at the end of the function. Let's look at a recursive example. On the left we have the C code for a recursive factorial program. On the right we have a MIPS implementation of this function. Notice that in a higher level language, recursion is very elegant and simple. In assembly language, it's a mess. So what we basically have to do when we recursively call ourselves, we have to push RA, and in this case our argument N, which is in A0, onto the stack, check to see if we're in the base case, and if not, recursively call yourself. So there's kind of a wind up stage at the first half of the function, and then there's wind down code at the end of the function. Let's demonstrate this program on a small example. Here's my main program to call the factorial program. And to save ourselves some grief, we're going to have a very small number n, which is just 3. But it's still going to be a lot of clicking. Let's assemble and start clicking. So now I'm going to my factorial. I'm pushing RA and A0 onto the stack, checking for the base case. It's not the base case, so I'm calling the function recursively. Again, pushing RA and A0 onto the stack, checking for base case. We're not there yet, so we call ourselves recursively. So we keep going through these few lines of code here until we get to the base case. Now we're at the base case, and we can start the wind down stage, which is going to be these lines of code over and over until over and over until we're done. I'll just let it run. We finally got our answer down here. 3 factorial is 6. So here's the factorial code and we did go through and single step through our wind up phase and then our wind down phase. This is not nearly so elegant as the recursive version in a higher level language. Also notice that you're using a stack a lot which could possibly result in a stack overflow. This is a very important example from the book. It shows two loops, two different ways to clear an array. On the left we have an array version, and on the right a pointer version. So let's look at the array version first. What we do first in this code is multiply our i times 4, add it to the base address of our array, and then store 0 out at that location. Then we add 1 to i, check for the end of the array, and keep looping. In the pointer version, we do a lot of the housekeeping before the loop, and so the loop only has four lines of code compared to six lines of code over here. We just store zero. We've already set up, before the loop, we've set up T0 to be a pointer to the next array element. Then all we have to do is just add four to point to the next word, and then keep looping. So most people prefer to use array indexing in a higher level language and are less comfortable with pointers. The good news is that compilers will take your code that you've written with array indexing and rewrite it in a pointer version. So you can kind of have your cake and eat it too. There are five addressing modes in a MIPS processor. An addressing mode just describes the way that the fields within the instruction are used for execution. 
Let's look at the immediate addressing mode first. In immediate addressing, the source operand RS is combined with the 16-bit immediate field. The destination register is RT. Register addressing mode uses three registers. RS and RT are combined as source registers. The destination register is RD. In register addressing, the opcode is always six zeros and the function code specifies the unique operation. Base addressing mode is sometimes called index addressing. The source register RS is added to the lower 16 bits of the instruction to form an address for a load or store instruction. For loads, RT will be the destination register. For stores, RT will hold the value to be written to memory. PC relative addressing is used for branch instructions. The source registers RS and RT are compared. The branch target address is calculated by combining the offset stored in the lower 16 bits of the instruction to the current value of the PC. After the branch, the PC will either point to the branch target address, if the condition was true, or to the instruction immediately below the branch if the condition was false. Pseudo-direct addressing is used for jumps. The 26-bit address field is reconstituted with the help of the PC and a shift instruction to form the address of the jump. Although we have five addressing modes, we only have three instruction formats. The R instruction format is used with register addressing. The J instruction format is used with pseudo-direct addressing. And the I format is used with immediate addressing, base addressing, and PC relative addressing. This lecture was shorter than most, but we covered a lot of important material. We learned about how to write non-leaf functions, including recursive functions, and we learned how to use the stack. We also looked at an example of character byte processing that will help us get ready for the next homework. We'll discuss all of these things in class. Until then, happy coding! Mm -hmm.